I'm excited about what God has set us in in this season. As we were preparing and the Lord gave us these series, I want you to know that as a church, we aren't just going like day by day trying to figure out what's next. The Lord has outlined where we are to move. And when this series came, what about my? It was a Lord, what, what is it that you want to talk about? <laughs> and the Lord put so clear as day. He said, I want to talk about the promises that the people think I have forgotten. I want to deal with the promises that the people think that won't come to pass because it's been taken some time. I want to deal with the promises that you think have been left because of a mistake that you made. The Lord said, I want to dive into what is a promise. Because we're going to walk through the scripture of what makes a promise, but I'm sorry to tell you today, you may find out that what you've been hoping for was not a promise for God, but just a desire that you wanted. And there's a difference between a promise and a want. And you can have promise hope with a want and desire, but that does not mean that the Lord has to deliver on something that he did not say. We're talking about what about my promise. As we get into this word today, I'm excited because it allows us to be able to dive into something that we oftentimes mistake. I've seen so many people leave the faith because they thought that God had broke a promise. Leaving their hope because what the Lord supposedly said to them didn't happen in the timeline that they wanted. And what we think sometimes is damaged or bruised believers is actually petulant, whining saints. But when you don't look in the word, you confide to your feelings and your feelings will cause you to go into a place of abandonment. But the Lord did not abandon you. He just didn't operate on your time. We're talking about what about my promise and even the statement in itself, if you hear it again and again, it comes off as an adolescent teenager who is complaining about not getting mommy and daddy's car. What about my promise? What about my wants? What about my needs? And truth be told, if he didn't deliver what he said he would do, he still would be good. His greatness is not confined to your wants or your needs. His greatness was defined when he separated the waters from the earth. His greatness was defined when he caused time to stand still. His greatness was defined when he literally caused death to literally pause. God's confidence is not built upon your want. It's something when we try to confine an all-knowing, all-knowing God. We try to make him fit into the box of our promise, but your promise is not going to make God a liar. He was good before your promise. He's going to be good during your promise. He's going to be good after your promise. I can tell you this, your Yelp review on God is not going to change who he is. We've been giving God bad reviews like he's an Uber driver. Your promise does not define who God is. As we walk in this text, I want us to see in the scripture, we've seen this year after year in our life. We walk through this text and, and so many times we take it out of context, as we often do. But I want to go back. I want to go way, way back. This is throwback Sunday. You're going to have to do some flipping. You don't got to go far in the book because we start in Genesis. So if this is your first Sunday, don't worry, you won't get lost. It's the first book in the Bible. So let's turn to Genesis. We're going to go right into this word. We're going to go into Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. And we're going to start in verse 1. We're going to look at what happens while you're waiting for a promise. Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, it starts here. And it says, after these events... Ah, let's talk about that real quick. After these events, what were the events? The events that happened that are going to lead to this scripture is Abram being obedient to follow the Lord. The Lord called Abram to walk into a land that he had not seen. His obedience is what sets up this picture. So many times we're going to walk through this text and we're going to see it and we're going to think that Abram was given an opportunity just because. A promise is begotten because of obedience. 
you don't earn a promise just because you are. You earn access to the promise keeper based upon your obedience. And we see here in the scripture, it says this, after these events, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. But in verse 2, it says, but Abram said, Lord God, what can you give me since I am childless? And the elder or heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Abram continued, look, you have given me no offspring. So a slave born in my house will be my heir. Some of us are only asking for God to do something because it looks like what you have is going to die with you. Based upon where Abram was, he had no one to take on the lineage of his legacy. So he goes on and says in verse four, the word of the Lord came to him. This one will not be your heir. Help me, Lord. Instead, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look at the sky and count the stars. If you are able to count them. <laughs> I love that about God. He tells you to try it, but I can guarantee you won't. <laughs> he said, count the stars if you are able to count them. And at that moment, he says, your offspring will be that numerous. So for someone who was obedient, who had access to ask, there was built a covenant. The foundation of a promise is a covenant. If you aren't in covenant with the Lord, you don't got a promise. If you are not in covenant or conversation or obedience with the Lord, you don't have a promise. You have a desire. A promise is built when there is conversation between the promise keeper and the promise wanter. If you ain't talked to him, you ain't got nothing. Based upon their conversation, he had audience to ask for something that he desired. What you don't understand sometimes about God is he'll give you access to his abilities, not because of anything that you've particularly done, but because of what you did for him. I was disqualified upon birth, but my access to you was based upon my post-birth obedience. This covenant. The covenant, the foundation of a promise is the covenant. And in this season here, we know that now the word has been declared to Abram. Your slave won't have your lineage. Well, Not only am I going to bless you with a child, but I'm going to bless you with a lot of them. <laughs> he said from the stars will be the number, as numerous as the stars will be your lineage. And in that season, Abram left on a thousand, he was on cloud nine. Because what just happened is the one who was able to do just gave me a word of what he was gonna do. And some of us in this season, we're standing here and right here is the start of the promise. That's where it was spoken from the Lord and confirmed to the promise wanter. And some of us in this season, we never left here. We never left here. Now I hate to be graphic, but it takes something to make something. Amen. All right, y'all know what I mean. I don't got to get all into, you know, okay, y'all got me, right? You got me. Some of us never leave from where the word was spoken to procreate or procreate the word that is promised. And some of us are still at the starting block of the confirmation, but never get to work to complete the heart. Okay, hold on. We never get to work to hear the promise completed. The Lord says, I'll change the situation. It's not that you haven't been trying, but let me get involved. It's not that what you've been wanting from God is going to automatically, miraculously happen without anything of your need. He's saying, if you just trust my word and get to work. Trust my word and then get to work. Yeah. The problem is, what do you do when you get to work in the first instance doesn't look like your promise? Y'all know how it is. Lord, I, I need you to bless my finances. So then you go sign up for some crazy lottery thing on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> then you get mad when you sign up for that $29.99 breakthrough and 
you respond to that email of that African prince who's going to provide you the wealth of his uncle that was left after that two trillion dollars or whatever, right? And what ends up happening is upon disappointment, you desert. Oh, let's walk. Upon disappointment, most of us don't leave not only the promise, but we leave the promise keeper. Because if you can't deliver on when I want it, I don't want you. God. We don't want to see God when we don't get what we want. So we leave from covenant. And what ends up happening is when we don't get what we want when we want it, we declare it dead. We declare the promise dead. Which means that I don't have to live a life that is living in a standard that could receive the promise. Because obviously you're not going to come through, so why should I continue to live right? So we act into sin because obviously my faithfulness didn't produce results. So obviously I don't need to continue this on. You stop drinking because you were waiting for the promise. But when the promise doesn't come, all of a sudden that fifth looks right. You stopped smoking when you wanted the promise, but now all of a sudden you got bong hits and, and literally bowl hits, but all of a sudden I was going to stop fornicating because the promise is on the way and the Lord can't send the promise to someone sleeping around. But you stop getting the promise and all of a sudden your tinder started popping. It's funny how access to sin becomes more prevalent when you declare it dead. But what we're going to do here is we're going to walk. We're about to look through the autopsy of a promise. The autopsy of a promise. Let's look through after you declare it dead. Is it still alive or is it literally aborted? The autopsy of a promise when waiting turns into doubt. The autopsy of a promise. What usually happens is when we don't see the promise fulfilled, we act on our own to try to make it come to pass. And what will end up happening is we become promise makers instead of promise waiters. Good God. When you don't get it the way you thought it was going to happen, you take matters into your own hand and try to act like God. So what happens here is Abram and his wife Sarai, they're waiting for this child. And when the child doesn't come, we're going to look here in the scripture in Genesis chapter 16. We're going to skip over. So go ahead and turn over to Genesis chapter 16. And we're going to see what happens when you don't feel like waiting. In Genesis chapter 16, verse 1, it says this. Abram's wife Sarai had not born any children for him. But, somebody say but. <laughs> she owned an Egyptian slave named Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, since the Lord has prevented me from bearing children, go to my slave. Perhaps through her I can build a family. Good God, there's so much to unpack there. Not only did she now attribute her defeat to the Lord, she took matters into her own hands. So what she says is, if I can't have the Lord do it, I'm going to make it happen on my own. So what she does is she takes her Egyptian slave named Hagar and what she does is something so ungodly that she moves her from slave to prostitute. So she moves her from being not only do I got to wait on you, clean up after you, watch everybody around you, take care of your animals and now you want me to lay with them. And some of us in this room, if you're not careful, you aren't the promised waiter, but you sleep in for them. Okay. Reevaluate where you are in your life, and if you're not careful, you could be in a backslidden way, not for anything that you will earn, but for the person who is acting outside of God's will. Are you the Hagar or are you waiting? Some of us are mad at God because we're getting used literally as concubines. So what she does here in the scripture, she goes on and she says, you'll perhaps make my family. And Abram agreed. Abram agreed. Why did Abram agree? Because he ain't never had a taste of that before. When you get frustrated on waiting on God, all of a sudden your inhibition of being holy goes out the window. Your whole desire of being pure goes out the window because you don't feel like waiting. 
You ain't never looked at her like that before. You ain't never desired after her like that before. But when it comes to you getting what you thought should be yours because it belongs to you because God said it, now all of a sudden you'll do anything to get what you want. And some of us in this season have taken on jobs because it will provide the money that God promised, not knowing that that job is the thing that's going to kill you. Coming home complaining, I can't stand that job. I can't stand that supervisor. I can't stand that boss. I'm sick of this traffic. He ain't tell you to take the job in the first place. Your promise was on the way. And there's nothing worse than God delivering your promise like an Amazon driver and you not being where he told you he was going to drop it. And the Lord is coming through, sweeping through the city, ready to deliver on his word. And you aren't even where you're supposed to be. So now it's not only a drop off. Now it's a deliverance. I got to save you to give you what I promise. God. And that's why some of us are uncomfortable in the season because right now he's doing an extraction before he can deliver. He can't even hand it to you because where you are is not where it's supposed to be. The death of a promise. So we see here going on in the scripture, we got a lot to walk through. Come on, stay with me. So Abram's wife, Sarai, in verse 3, took Hagar, her Egyptian slave, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as a wife for him. It wasn't enough for you to sleep with him. Now I need you to build covenant. Oh. You see, there was a covenant built between Abram and God. And now, because Sarai has stepped in and given over Hagar, they have to try to build a new covenant to still fulfill the promise. And some of us are giving our covenant aptitude over to something that does not belong to glory. And we see here in the scripture that after she gives them to her, in verse 4 it says, he slept with Hagar, and she became pregnant. So it wasn't that his soldiers weren't working, he just couldn't wait. Can we get real? We family. This is not just a biblical text from back then. Some of us in this room and some of us watching our line are even allowing people into our bedrooms because we don't want to fulfill the duties as a wife or as a husband. Having threesomes and polygamous relationships causing the bounds of marriage and the constrictions of what God says is righteous and holy because you don't want to be who God called you to be. Talking about it's 2023, it's cool. It ain't cool, it's wrong. Inviting things into your room that are not of God and now all of a sudden you mad because he wants her more than you. And the reason why he's okay with getting more from her is because she delivers what you can't. Help me, Holy Ghost. Help me, Holy Ghost. He gets what he was promised but not in the way that God intended. Hagar bears a child for Abram, but the problem is when you bear something out of God's will, it is not the lineage that he promised. My promise was that the bloodline would come through her, not just through you. It takes two to tango. <laughs> And when the Lord says he's going to provide something through your hands or through your loins or through your lineage or through your mind, he is doing it based upon the foundations and the formulas that he created before time even began. And what happens is when we take the peace that he was hoping would stay in line, we are now in sin. Oh, I feel like preaching today. Good Lord. We see here that Hagar now is being subjected to a sinful nature, not because of her wants, but based upon her ownage. And some of us need to check our circles because you aren't there to be the laugh partner. They waiting for you to lay down. Oh, ooh, Jesus. They're waiting for you to be usable for when they want. That's why some of the conversations you have don't sit right with you. That's why you don't even respond no more to the group text. That's why all of a sudden you don't got the deposit for the vacation that you wanted to go on. The Lord is trying to deliver you out of Hagar's situations because if you stay long enough, you'll become pregnant with something that's not his. We see here in the text that he's moving now. He's given this child and what happens is after she produces the child, Sarai becomes angry with Hagar. It seemed like a good idea because if you couldn't bear the child the way that I can't bear the child, that means something's wrong with him. Oh, come on, come on. 
But the anger produces when she's able to give him what she could not. You was all good just a week ago. It was cool when you laid with him, but the moment you started showing, I started hating. And some of us in this season, we're pregnant with purpose and the people around us are not mad at us because we're good, but because we're carrying something that should be in them. So she becomes hateful towards Hagar to the point where Hagar even runs away because now I don't feel loved in the room that I was given to. I thought this was a partnership. I thought it was his wife. I thought you were his wife. I thought this was going to be the Brady Bunch. But when you're out of the will of God and you go from covenant to contempt, it's a long way from promise. It's a long way from promise. And we see here the autopsy of a promise. Not only does it deliver something that we don't like, you have to still speak life into the thing that you're waiting for. And waiting is uncomfortable. Waiting does not feel good. Waiting sometimes causes you to look back over your life and say, am I built for this? But if the Lord had the momentum to speak it into your life, that means that surely there is something deep down inside of you that can produce what it is he's calling you to. That doesn't mean I need an impartation. If it wasn't in you before he spoke it, he would have given it to you. No batteries needed. In the instruction booklet of your life, he would have told you, I'm giving you a promise, but I need you to do number one. Number two, go through this detour, then come back, and then the promise will come. God's promise and his timing does not operate as the earth's. One day is like a thousand years to the Lord. You want to put him in the chronos when he operates in the kairos. And the problem is some of us have left our hope and our faith in the Kronos, not knowing that his will and his obedience to what he spoke is in the Kairos, which means he can even cause time to stand still to produce what it is that he said he would do. You've been looking for an ASAP promise, not knowing that if he delivered it when you wanted it, you would have fumbled the bag. That's why he didn't give you riches during depression because when depression you would have spent it on something that you shouldn't have put it in. That's why he didn't give you the money in that year because you didn't see the housing market crashing. You would have bought about 15, 11 homes trying to flip them the in the real estate venture that you are and you would have lost it all and then you would have blamed him. His timing is his timing because it's right and it's good. He sees what he sees even beyond your wants, even beyond your eyes. Because some of us, we got hungry eyes. And when you're hungry, you don't see that what you're eating can kill you. The promise is not dead. It's not dead. If you move over, we're going to jump over some time. Move to Genesis chapter 1, y'all. Stay with me. Genesis chapter 1, we see here. But after she's given Hagar... It could have ended there. Now, I'm not too high and mighty and saved that I would think that upon disobedience and sinful nature, that now with this moment that God is no longer bound to the promise that he gave. I would think that at the moment of you disqualifying yourself, that means I am exempt. Upon you living an unrighteous and unclean life, I don't got to do what I said I was going to do. But aren't you glad that God does not disqualify you based upon the desires that you know are not his? He still is a man of his word. And that's why some of us got to realign our lives to righteous and clean living. Because when we make a mistake, we think it's easier to stay in dirt instead of apologizing. An apology is not speaking in tongues. Apologizing is admitting that what I did caused you to be sad, which means I need to say that I did it, first off, acceptance, and then I need to turn from what caused you to be unpleased with me. It caused righteous living to get the covenant, which means I need to realign myself after sin back to the place that you gave it. If you want the delivery of his word, you have to get back to right standing where you were in good timing with God to make the promise. For some of us, you're asking, what about my promise? Your promise has not been forsaken. It's just on hold. Is your lifestyle indicative of making it come to pass? Are you even looking like where you were looking when he told it to you? 
When he spoke it to you, you had a prayer life. When he spoke it to you, you was fasting. When he spoke it to you, you had community. But the moment it didn't come when you want, you forsook it all. All of a sudden, your Bible app is empty. All of a sudden, you don't know what it is to fast. That's a diet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we see here that now the Lord is going to respond to his word. And in chapter 21, we see here, verse 1, it says, The Lord came to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Let's stop there. Let's stop. If you don't notice that, Sarai now has become Sarah. Uh -huh. yeah. Abram has now become Abraham. Uh -huh. yeah. Which means that even in a season of waiting for your promise, some things in your life will change. Yeah. Even what they call you will shift. Mm. <laughs> and the question is, are you in right standing to know not to accept or respond to what you used to be called? So what happens is when the Lord changes Abram and Sarai's name to Abraham and Sarah, he redefines the covenant again. Yes, yes. Because I had to, oh, here we go. If y'all remember, Beyonce, I, peace to Renaissance. Some things you say is off the chains, but she said I had to get a new ring because you messed up the last one. So what ends up happening is the Lord now has to redefine what he calls you to produce a new covenant because you jacked that one up. Yeah. And Abraham's name now goes from Abram to Abraham because when I let you keep your name, you didn't get it. But I'm going to change your name to reflect my covenant. Yes. Abraham means father of many nations. Yes. His name is now in response to what God said, which means whenever anyone calls you, it's a slow reminder to you that I have not forgotten you, I have not forsaken you, and no matter how far you try to run, my word and my covenant will chase you down. I love it because whenever anyone calls out Abraham's name, it echoes into the spirit realm and it causes God to remember and remind every single day that Abraham, I have not forgotten you. I have not forsaken you. I have not left your lineage to die. But no matter where you go, I got you. The question is, are you dialed in enough to hear that he changed your name? Are you dialed in enough to the spirit to know that he changed your name? So in verse one, it comes and says that the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. And in verse two, it says that Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age yes. at the appointed time that God had told him. <laughs> because just a little bit ago. The Lord visited Abraham and Sarah and told her around this time next year. I not only am I going to confirm to you again, but I'm going to visit you. Yeah, yeah. And the question is, have you been available to have a visit from God? Because before with the last covenant, there was no timeline. But with this one, the Lord says, I'm going to keep my word and I'm also going to give you a time frame. Yeah. Bless his name. And the time frame is not for us as humans to be able to count down the clock. It's for us to be able to confirm to everyone around us he did what he said he was going to do. He's a God who will perform and he's a God who was a promise keeper and he literally does what he says. And it says at the appointed time that God had told him in verse three, it says Abraham named his son who was born to him. The one Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Yes. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded him. Amen. Oh, I got seven. Let me go at it. Abraham now has to do something on the promise that is not uncomfortable. It's not comfortable to the promise to cut on it. Yeah, yeah. And the problem is when we finally get the promise, we don't want to follow through on the whole word. Yeah. Isaac is given to Abraham and Abraham was told by God to circumcise Isaac. Right. And the problem is some of us don't want to cut on what we've been given. The promise has been delivered to your hands, and I hear it is even as clear as day right now. The Lord told you he would give you that financial blessing if you were to give it back to him partial. And the moment that direct deposit hits your bank, you ain't want to give up none of it. 
The Lord told you that he was going to send you a husband after his own heart. And the moment that he gave you the husband, all of a sudden, you don't want to go to church no more because you want to be at the house all day. It ain't that many amount of times you can do it over and over. Get to the house. He said that he would produce children to you as long as you raise them up in right standing and understanding of who God is. But all of a sudden, you don't know how to teach your children about God because your lifestyle don't match up with God. You don't want to cut on what he promised. Just because he gave it to you does not mean you get to do whatever you want with it. He called him to circumcise his son, and he circumcised his son in the exact time that God said. And in verse 5, it says this. I love this. Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. A hundred. What's interesting is they say in the scripture, there's no exact dates, but it's saying that it was almost 25 years from the time that Abram was promised to where Abram was delivered. And some of us want to leave the faith after six weeks and not getting what we want. We don't, we don't even want to make it to the next Sunday. God, you said you was going to heal me. And the reason why we don't get excited about waiting is because we didn't told the whole world that it was going to happen in a time that he didn't promise. So you don't want to show up to tell people that it didn't happen because that means they got to look at you like, what did you do? You want the deliverance to happen through the week so you can come brag about it on Sunday. You want to floss and stunt with your promise. It was never intended for you to show off. It was intended for him to get the glory. Well, what will you do when he gives you what he told you he was going to give? At 100 years old, the promise was delivered. 100 years old. I love this. In verse 6, as we get ready to close this out, I'm going to go over a few points with you to keep you going through the week. In verse 6, it says, Sarah said, here comes Sarah. God has made me laugh, and everyone who hears will laugh with me. I like that. They'll laugh with me, not at me. Some of us quit the promise because we think that everyone around us is laughing at us because we're still waiting. Can I do a PSA for you real quick? Ain't nobody worried about you. They are not worried. They got their own promises they're waiting for. They got their own healings that they're waiting for. Ain't nobody stunting you. Ain't nobody worried about you holding on to God and his unchanging hands. Ain't nobody counting down the days from you to get your promise or your deliverance. I got my own promise I'm waiting for. You out here aborting the process worried about what them and they going to say. Ain't nobody stunting you. says that Sarah says and now everyone will laugh with me because sometimes when God does something that does not align with society it's funny it's funny when you get a financial deliverance that doesn't even align with your credit score it's funny when you get approved at that car dealership and you don't got to put 1500 down it's funny when you get approved for that house, when you know you should only be in a one-bedroom apartment, but you got an apartment with a house on top of the garage, that's funny. What's funny is when the enemy thought he could kill you and you go to the doctor's office and they said, that spot I thought I saw, I don't see no more. It's funny. When you standing in the literal chow line like good times and your food stamps are now declined because you're making more than what you was making a year ago, it's funny. It's funny because I didn't do it. It's funny because and when I look back over my life, if I even orchestrated this with my own mind, I couldn't do it. I couldn't maneuver my life to look like it does. But when the promises of God are fulfilled, it literally causes everyone around you to acknowledge him. You don't got to follow him, but you're going to acknowledge him. Because every time you bring up what I got, I'm going to point it to him. When you walk in my house and you say, this is a beautiful edifice. This is a nice home. You got a lobby. Girl, are those 10-foot ceilings? Jesus did it. 
when they pull up and your car has all the tires on it and all the rims match and the paint job ain't chipped I'm gonna look at the car and look at you and say baby Jesus did it when I look at my children back in church even though they've been running for 15 11 years and you look at me saying that's great parenting it ain't great parenting Jesus did it when I look at my doctor's report which should have had me in the grade 10 years ago and you say how did you make it I'm gonna look at you put my chest out and look you right in your eye and decree and declare that Jesus did it ain't no devil in hell that can delay or deny the promises of yes and amen Hey family, I pray that you were blessed by today's word. If you were, I want you to do this. Hit those comments up just like you're in the room and shout me down. If this has impacted your life and you want it to impact someone else's, hit the share button, hit like, and hit subscribe. We want you a part of our e-family. If you have not yet, meet us in person in the room at 1030 a.m. on Sundays. I know online's great, but we want to meet you and do life with you. Catch a flight, catch a train, get in the car, turn the Spotify playlist Lord and make a road trip out of it but we want to connect with you I pray that you have an amazing week that your life is transformed and that blessings follow you and chase you down for the rest of your life God bless you see you soon